Hello everyone, and here we are for another episode of DOD 45. I am Ty of Art by Ty, and our guest on the show today is renowned tattoo artist Teresa Sharp. She was winner of season two of Oxygen's reality tattoo composition show called Best Ink in 2013. She's managed to carve out an excellent career for herself and is really an amazing artist. And I'm very grateful to her for sitting down and chatting with us on this episode of Drawing Over Discussions. So we speak on things like how she managed through the pandemic as a tattoo artist, who controls the music in the tattoo shops, that's a real thing, and her entering the tattoo industry back when it was mainly still a boys club. We also chat about her animals, a dog, hairless cats, horses, how awesome would that be, and her crow named Eric, who has his own Instagram page, by the way, at Eric the Crow. We get into how winning Best Ink opened doors for more international travel and the release of her sketchbook, Random Acts of Unkindness. It's really rad for me to chat with other visual artists and with someone who made a career out of something I envisioned myself doing some 20 plus years ago, but I just didn't have it in me. Teresa, however, reached it and is at the top of her game. The unknown inspires curiosity. Anyway, without further ado, Teresa, how are you? How are you? Good. Good. <laughs> So before I start the timer again, what I like to do is just check in and see how how um, how the guest is doing. So how how is everything for you? How how have you been? Yeah, doing good. Uh, busy, busy, busy. Trying to catch up on all the stuff that couldn't work on during COVID and whatnot. So it's a lot of tattoo projects that obviously just kind of got pushed out further and further and further with all of that. So now I feel like I'm playing catch up. Did you, were you able to come like do anything that you, that had been kind of on the back burner for you because of how busy you were? Were you able to accomplish any of those things during the lockdown or was it really just? Um, I was able to work on some paintings. I was able to get a lot of paintings done that I had wanted to do. Um, I got further into this oil painting that I just recently finished. Is that the one with the candles? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, that one had been in the works for probably a couple of years. So I was really excited to actually have time to like dedicate to it and be like, you're going to finish this. <laughs> All right. Well, I will, I will get this timer going and we'll, uh, We'll uh, officially start drawing this piece. All right, so usually the first thing I like to start with, once I start the timer, is a Sophie's Choice question. Uma as Mia or Mia as Lilu? Oh, Mia, Mia for sure. As Lilu, yeah. Are you a fan of that show? Yeah. Do you, are you a fan, are you a movie fan in, gen, in general or? Oh yeah, definitely. I, man, I used to watch a lot more films and then I don't know what happened in the last like three years, but <laughs> I don't know if my life just got crazy or what. Uh, or I think maybe it was cause like I stopped doing like actual television and now like everybody does streaming services. So like, I don't have commercials. So I have no idea what movies are coming out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like weird when you realize that you go to like somebody's house randomly and they have cable and their commercials come on and like movies are coming out and you're like, whoa, they're making that? That's the, they're making that movie. Like I literally just found out today that they're making a Swamp Thing movie. I was like, I had no idea. <laughs> One of my <laughs> questions was going to be the Swamp Thing or the thing. Oh, the thing for sure. Oh, awesome. Are yeah. you, were you a Swamp Thing fan though at all? Uh, not. Or is that before your time? I, I do remember it from when I was a kid growing up. My brother had this like Swamp Thing action figure he always had the cooler toys. I was always like so jealous of his toys. And he had this like Swamp Thing action figure where like you could pull all his limbs apart and they would they were like attached by strings. So then they'd just be all like floppy. And then like you hit a button and it like suck them all back in. And like 
yeah he he read a couple of the comics that had swamp thing in him um i i guess as a character like he's just not as interesting to me yeah were you into are you into toy like toy figures uh, like he-mans and stuff like that or is that not uh I mean, uh i don't really collect i don't collect a lot of them but i do really appreciate them um i've i've had a few people like get me some of the like pop figures you know in relation to like movies that i like and stuff uh and then i've had people buy me because my favorite movie is the crow so i have a lot of people that will pick up like little the crow memorabilia stuff to send to me and like in this cabinet behind me there's like an eric draven doll at the top like in the glass window because you know it makes sense yeah. <laughs> um i definitely prefer to collect artwork as opposed to figures yeah. i i spend more money on like books and paintings and things like that and especially like once i got to a point where i could afford some like original paintings from people then i was like that's where it's at <laughs> yeah, that's fun. when you were like if you were early on to doing tattoos what when did you start doing tattoos and was it in 2009 or something yeah 2009 did you do you listen to music did you ever watch like do you have movies on like when you're doing pieces like what will be usually like in the shops that i came up in we all we all had music and i started in a shop where everybody had their own like room where you could like close the door and like it would just be your stuff and your music um so that was kind of nice and i got to listen to all the shitty music that i listened to when i was younger is that a shop issue does that is that like you know music controlling the music like is that something that often comes up in shops yeah if you're in an open air shop where like you're all sitting in one room tattooing you can't have like five different stereos going so there's got to be an overall like ambience to the day and whoever gets there first usually puts on the music or if you have a manager that sits at the front desk you know like they might fuck with the music and it was before you had like things like Alexa or things like that where you could just shout out what you wanted and it would change and since you have gloves on like you're right you know being able to like change a cd or change a song on your ipod or something like unless you made a playlist like we didn't have spotify when i started tattooing like we didn't have like it was like cds or an ipod playlist or you know whatever music you illegally downloaded online and saved to some kind of thumb drive and that was it and so you know being able to control that environment and have the music that you wanted to listen to was you know the best and then I remember when we moved like the shop I was with them for like eight years and so we were in the first building for a while where we all had our own rooms and then we got a bigger space but it was open air and so we're all tattooing in one room we can only have one thing playing and it, it was such a uh, like really tense time because everybody still wanted that choice. Like they still wanted to be, and so like we brought stereos like for our little spaces. And then like every now and then, like you try to listen to something and then like management would be like, you, you can't, we have, it's too much. There's too much playing. <laughs> so, uh, but it's just like, I remember my, my manager's brother would come in and like manage sometimes and he would always put on like Lana Del Rey, all Lana Del Rey for like two hours. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to fall asleep. I cannot. <laughs> She's like yawn singing. Like, I can't do this. <laughs> um, you know, and then like my boss, like he listened to um, Misfits and Danzig and that like that kind of like era Metallica, like all the time. And it was just like always that music every time he picked. And I, I remember just being like, at the time, I didn't really know, like, I, nobody had ever introduced me to the Misfits or Danzig or stuff. Like, I'd heard the songs, obviously, like, in movies and stuff like that, but didn't really, like, know or care about it. And so I, I, I came by, like, hating it. I was like, I hate this fucking music. I'm so tired of it. It's on all the time. And then it took me, like, years to get over that. And now I'm like, no, no, it's it's good. I like it. I see why people like it. It's good. <laughs> when you're doing a... Uh... So usually like based off my artwork, a lot of the, my uh, people will always ask me, like, want to know what kind of music I listen to. And they always assume that it's uh, metal or something just based off of my style of artwork. But I actually can't listen. I don't I don't mind metal, but I can't listen to really aggressive music because I find that it it uh, starts steering my drawing into aggressive uh, imagery. You know, it's not what I'm going for. I like that to come out of my head. Um, I was just wondering if usually when you're doing a piece or it's 
mostly planned out or do you get um some freestyle in when you're doing your in you're doing your pieces um when i'm tattooing it's definitely um pretty thought out like i i have a plan and especially nowadays with like the ipads and stuff it's a lot easier to have a color study ready to go and references sitting next to me so i'm not really having to guess or try to figure out what i'm going to do with the next area uh, a lot of times with the bigger pieces, you kind of do like a quick outline of everything so that you have like a map for what you're going to be doing, uh, or at least that's the way I do it. And so that makes it a little easier to just kind of like enjoy that day of just like going in and adding color or shading and stuff like that. Um, the only hard part I think is like, I don't mind the music so much. And a lot of times, like I'm, I'm in an open air shop now, so we all kind of have to be down for whatever music's playing. But luckily, like all the people I work with right now, we all kind of vibe to the same stuff. So there hasn't been a lot of days where it's like, why this, you know? <laughs> How great is Alexa? Like just to be able to shout out like, hey, just play me all of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was at a shop recently that has that feature and I was like, oh, that's so nice. Cause like, we still don't have Alexa. We have like Sonos, which is nice speakers, but mm -hmm. you still have to like get on Spotify and like pick the music you want to listen to. And that's great until like you've realized that you've heard that playlist like three times. You're like, I thought I put it on a radio station. Then you realize that Spotify just like kind of builds you a playlist and they call that a radio station. And yeah, what's up with that? I feel like Spotify is like every six months or so, like they're, they're, the way that their app works changes because I used to be able to just like put on a playlist that I made. And then when that playlist ran out, it would just start filling in like with music that was like those artists it's mm -hmm. like oh and so you would kind of maybe discover artists that you hadn't heard of through that and now it won't do that like it'll if, if i have a playlist that only has five songs on it it just keeps playing those five songs and i'm like what happened spotify <laughs> you used to be more intuitive like what is going on? is there like a setting i gotta like go and fuck with like <laughs> probably, probably that they didn't tell anybody <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's like instagram like they they make all these changes they don't tell you and then they're like mm, i don't know yeah, i know you're you... seeing your post oh that's weird <laughs> yeah you'll have a lot of like on your when you're sharing your uh like uh, work that you've done there's a, it's a lot of bodies so like are you having to deal with this whole sensitive content thing that's happening on instagram I haven't noticed it yet, um, but I also have quite a few followers, so I don't know. I feel like it's going to affect more people that have less people watching them. You know, yeah. like if you already are only at like a 10,000 follower limit or something like that, and they start limiting sensitive content, like I, I know that Instagram is famous for doing that to uh, accounts where like because like they'll flag stuff for nudity on artists accounts where it's like a drawing or a painting and they'll mm -hmm. flag it and, and pull it and all that stuff and then like some other account that's literally like kind of a porn account won't get flagged and I think it's because they've reached a higher limit of people watching them so Instagram's like well we don't want to we don't want to hurt them because they're creating more interaction but we'll hurt these guys because they're not really that big yet I know that's the case because I've been asked by lots of artists how I get around posting like back pieces where like somebody's butt is in the photo um, or with like a fair amount of nudity. And it's just, I'm going to just assume because it's, I, I have enough people watching that Instagram's like, well, it's okay. It's, yeah. it's okay for her. <laughs> like, well, I, have a, I had a, uh, a uh, Sophie's Choice question, but it's not even, it's going to be useless because I think you already mentioned it because it was going to be the crow or the craft. <laughs> oh, God, that is really, I mean, I have to go with the crow. That's my all time love. Yeah. But the craft is like right there with it, you know? Did you see the new, the remake of the craft? Oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I won't do either. <laughs> um, is there a difference between uh, a raven and a crow? Yeah, so ravens are bigger and their tails end in like a diamond shape and a crow's tail is kind of more like straight across fan uh the heads are a little different like the beaks on the ravens are bigger uh ravens tend to be less uh people friendly crows are a little more interactive with humanity you have a pet crow right named eric yes and how does that how does that come about how do you <laughs> <a pet> <laughs> I 
always I mean I've loved crows for a really long time like they're just so cool and they're like the best they're just so quirky and smart and and cool and I think mythologically they have a lot of like fun mythology that's associated with them Mm so I've always been kind of obsessed with them and then obviously the movie the crow was like oh he's got a pet crow it's so tight you know like so yeah I've just I've always had this obsession since I was a kid and then I never thought I would have one I never thought I like was going to have a pet crow uh especially because I had definitely looked up what that would be like and it was like oh you can't have like you can't get one because it's illegal because you know they're like under the protected like bird act you can only own a north american crow or raven if you are a licensed rehabber and you are rehabbing it to go to release it back into the wild have you had others that you've no eric's not a north american crow oh oh so that's how you get around it (laughs) does can i ask you i don't know anything about your uh crow but does he bring you little treats and do little things? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, especially in his, like, if I go, his cage is huge. He has, like, this, like, uh, it's, it's, like, eight feet tall. It's about seven by six feet, and that's, like, his house. And so, like, I can walk into it. It's, like, a tall cage. And so a lot of times, like, when I get home from work or when I get up in the morning, he always wants me to come and, like, say hi to him. So, like, I'll walk into his cage and, like, talk to him and stuff and he'll usually like grab a piece of food out of his bowl and he'll bring it to me and he'll try to give it to me and then I'll be like okay thank you and I'll give it back to him and then he'll take it and then he'll give it back to me and like he'll just kind of keep playing that game until he like gets tired of it and then he'll just eat it (laughs) does he have a is there does he have a version of of like cuddling yeah um for him it's like when he lets me really like pet him, like really get into his feathers and like give him scratches and stuff like that. And he'll like kind of close his eyes and get really into it. And that's kind of his version of cuddling. Cause like, they don't really like to be held like upside down or anything like that. It's like, like a cat or a dog where you can like pick him up and just like squeeze him and stuff. Um, but he'll like come like perch on my shoulder, perch on my arm and then like, want me to interact with him want me to pet him and stuff like that so he's very like interactive he very much like wants to be a part of whatever's going on does he have attitude at all or like is he temperamental or is he pretty no he gets pissed about things for sure yeah yeah Yeah. usually like it's the dog he hates the dog oh yeah hates the dog what will he do like when he's pissed off scream (laughs) oh oh, is it loud too (laughs) yeah oh yeah what do you think is the is the number one thing um, that people would say about you after, like, if you hung out with them for the first time, like, all night? What, what is it? <laughs> I, I'm so internal that I don't even really think about like that. Yeah. Uh, people have definitely come up to me like a year or two after I met them, and they're like, "Remember that one time you said that thing?" And I'm like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> do you have a good memory? Um, I think I have a good memory. Like I can remember movies really well and like artists and, and, you know, stuff that I study and like mythology and books that I read. But like when it comes to interactions with people, I think I just kind of, I just go with the flow. I just let whatever happened happen. And I don't think about it too much. <laughs> yeah, a good way to roll. What, what, what do you, do you prefer giving a tattoo or receiving a tattoo? Oh, definitely giving a tattoo. Oh my God, receiving sucks. <laughs> Are you not one of those people that just uh, that claim they love it? Nope. <laughs> I don't know many people that do. I'm like, I don't know a lot of people that are like, yeah, this is great. I love getting tattooed. Fucking I have several friends <laughs> that uh, claim that they miss it and they just love it. But I don't, I just, I don't, that's not, I don't subscribe. I don't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> you tell them all that they're liars. <laughs> <laughs> um do you get a lot of uh like uh how, how do i get into the tattoo in- industry dms <laughs> oh yeah definitely uh, people that are like trying to apprentice or are apprenticing always message me with questions um which you know like it doesn't it doesn't bother me that people do that because i would do the same thing if i was you know at that point i definitely did i think when i was trying to get in tattooing like randomly message people to see if they'd help me out, you know, like tell me things or help me get tattooed or whatever. When you were starting um, out then how, where were you getting, um, like learning how to, uh, do tattoos and, and ga- gathering any of that information? 
So it, it took me a while to find an apprenticeship. I, especially I think at the time, because it still wasn't super popular for girls to be tattooing when I started, which is crazy because that was only like 11 years ago. But um, I remember it being like hard to find other girls who were tattoo artists, who weren't just like piercers in the shop or front desk girls. Uh, it was really hard to find other girls who'd been tattooing even for like you know a few years like uh in the town that I came up in which there's a lot of tattoo shops there there was only one other girl that I knew of that tattooed in my town that was it wow yeah and I don't even think she tattoos anymore I think uh, I think she got out of it so it was a uh, it was hard to like get that start as a girl at that time because it wasn't popular and it was like kind of like a boys club for a long time where like they they would always just like bring their friends in like if you were a friend of a tattoo artist you would get hired to learn how to tattoo even if you didn't have any artistic skill because they saw it more as a trade and not so much as an art form and over the last like 11 years that has really like kind of changed and they've noticed that people that come in with like an art background adapt to and learn how to tattoo faster than somebody that doesn't. So that's definitely changed a lot. It's a little easier to get into the industry now if you come with some kind of like knowledge about art or you've been doing art for a while before you get into it. Um, but yeah, like I had, I'd gone to college, had like a full art degree and was like, I just wanna learn how to tattoo. And I'd take my portfolio and they'd be like, eh, I don't know, we're gonna hire Brad over here. <laughs> it's like, why? And they're like, well, he's Tim's friend and, you know, he seems cool. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that sucks. Is that, do you, do you find that that still kind of is the case or is it, I mean, obviously there's been some progression there, but do you still find that there are, uh, that that is still an issue? I think the issue now isn't so much that artists don't want to hire uh, good people who want to learn. Like, I, I don't think it has to be a friend so much anymore. But I do think that it's hard to get an apprenticeship with an artist who is uh, well versed in the craft. I think that you find a lot of apprenticeships happening in uh, places with people who shouldn't be teaching, who right. like are not at a level to be trying to bring somebody else up into it. Um, I've definitely noticed a, an increase of like people who are like two or three years into tattooing, try to teach somebody else how to tattoo and like, I didn't even feel confident when I was five years into tattooing. Like, I only probably within the last few years felt like I really kind of had a really solid grasp on what I was doing and felt like I could maybe like teach that to somebody else. And that's, you know, like a year or two ago is when I finally started doing seminars to talk about like what I do as a tattoo artist. But uh, before that, I would not have even dreamed of it. <laughs> like, right. I was like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for that. It's like, I, but I see it as a lot of responsibility. And I think that there are other people who see it as a, a way to bring somebody in that's going to make you money, right. either by doing tattoos in your shop or by charging them for an apprenticeship, which happens a lot. And it's kind of unfortunate because I feel like these kids just get taken advantage of because they really want to do it. They're like, I want to be a tattoo artist. And then somebody's like, yeah, if you give me like $5,000, I'll teach you. Yeah. And then like, you know, three months in, they're like not learning anything. <laughs> yeah. Those are my least favorite humans in the world. People who take advantage of um, artists who are in any field, but artists who are, um, you know, wanting to get their work out there. And by like, th that's just the preying on the people that, you know, you know, they're they'll give everything for that opportunity. And oh, I, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, apprenticing is not easy and it's not, it's definitely not for everybody. And I've seen people get into it and then like you know a couple years into it they're like just they they don't have any passion for it and they they end up not staying with it you know do you have an opinion on that on um, that whole uh like um apprentice hazing shit oh i hate it i think yeah. it's stupid do they still do that i mean it's been a long time since i've been around a shop like i did tattoos 25 years ago i'm sure um, there are still shops that do that uh, absolutely. I mean, the ones that are just full of a bunch of asshole dudes that want to fucking, you know, they think it's funny or they think, well, I went through it, so they should have to go through it kind of shit. Uh, yeah. There's definitely that that mentality still exists in, in towns and stuff like that with uh, shops where there's not like somebody 
above them kind of setting the tone. Um, I just do my best to like tell as many apprentices as I can that they don't have to put up with that shit. (laughs) I'm like, if this is happening to you, like leave. Like, I'm sorry. It is not worth it. Um, you, so you also, you have pet hairless cats or you do a rescue for them or something too? Yeah, I I have to, um, I went through a brief period of my life where I was breeding them and I was trying to help like get the health of the breed to be stronger because they're a lot of times have uh, heart issues and it comes from a genetic defect in the breed that occurred like way early on when they were starting the breed. So in order to like try to breed it out of them, you have to find cats that don't have it and then, you know, put them together and hopefully get they hopefully get babies that don't have it. But I got really discouraged in that world because <laughs> like, a lot of people just don't care. And so I stopped doing it. So I just have my, my two now, my boy and his grandson. Do they tend to have health issues? I just, I know I hear, I maybe saw a show or something, someone talking about how difficult they can be and how, how against they were about people getting them, you know, just people who randomly like, oh. Yeah, um, so I, not any more than any other cat. Oh. Honestly, like mine have been pretty healthy their entire lives. Uh, they, I mean, obviously you can't, you can't leave them outside if you live in like, a climate that gets cold because they don't have hair, but they do. I mean, the breed originated in Canada. It's just a, it's not a designer breed. Like they didn't like breed it into a cat. It was something that just naturally occurred in nature. So you just had two cats that got together that both carried a hairless gene and it's just, it's natural. So it is a specific breed because it is something that can just randomly occur at any time. Um, but obviously like they've, taken that where they found it and like started creating a a much stronger gene so that they can continue to pass it on but it's uh I wouldn't say that they're inherently more unhealthy than like any other cat breed I think it just depends on who's breeding them and whether or not they're doing their due diligence to make them healthy that's like I think but that's like in anything like if you buy a dog from somebody that's breeding dogs and they're not doing the right thing and testing for hip problems and testing for heart problems and te- like there's certain breeds of animals where they've found like dna markers and you can run a blood test and learn real quick if they have it or not and then just not breed that and people don't do it yeah yeah because they're more concerned about making they, the money off of it or something or they just inbreed it so that they can sell yeah. expensive yeah. And- yeah. When you, when you breed things, you have to wait a certain amount of time to find out if, if there isn't a genetic test that you can do to find out if an animal carries a bad gene, then you have to keep that animal long enough to find out if anything bad happens to it. And when you breed stuff, like you only breed a female cat for like a few years and like a male cat for like one or two years, and then you fix them. And then a lot of times breeders just give them away or they like sell them to somebody as a pet. And then they don't really know what happens to them because they don't keep track of all of the animals that they've created. So then you never know if something pops up that's a genetic defect that would then affect that entire line of cats. And it's the same with like horses, same with dogs. Like I think a lot of people just do it because they think it's going to be fun uh, and they'll make like extra money, but really there's no money in it. Like right. the amount of if you're doing it right, the amount of medical bills and food and space that you need to have in order to like do it right and do it in a healthy way is really hard. Like in other countries, but so the boy that I have is actually from Sweden and I loved the people that bred him because they had a program where they would only keep a couple cats at their house. And then if they had one that they wanted to breed, they would give it to a friend and like they didn't all have to live in the same house so they would like do this like shared thing where it's like okay you keep this one and you keep this one and you know like they can be your pet and then one day we're like we might borrow them for a weekend to breed and then 
you know, but they like could keep track of things better and the animals were happier and healthier and just less stressed out. And in the States, like I've run into breeders that keep their cats in like cages. They have like cat runs or they have like bedrooms that they keep them locked up in and then they're not socialized and they're not healthy. And, you know, it's just, uh, it causes a lot more problems. Right. Did anyone breed, breed them to, um, have their uh, hind legs be a uh, uh, octopus tentacle? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Just happened. Oh. <laughs> How about a uh, Sophie's choice? Uh, Billy Ray Cyrus or Billy Eilish? <laughs> oh, Billy Eilish for sure. <laughs> um, uh, oh, are you into movie like movie stars or celebrity? Or is that is that something you? Yeah, some of them. Yeah, I don't like super obsess over anybody, yeah. but I do have preferences i don't know why it's interesting to me but i was just wondering if you've tattooed like a celebrity if you have a, you know a tattoo out there i don't know that stuff's just interesting to me whenever i see like nba basketball players or people walking around with a tattoo like i have tattoos on people but you know they're just regular people and unfortunately when i was doing tattoos there was nothing there was no way to figure it out so i started with the you know the the pen, you know, the pen and the guitar string, like I started oh, yeah. with that. And then I was just like, oh, okay, I guess I'll order this gun, this uh, machine from uh, this magazine. There was one magazine at the time. I mean, really, this was like 24 years ago. <laughs> and so I didn't know anything how to do it. So now I see some of these tattoos on people and I'm like, man, I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I have this out there too. And I had real machine, real machines. <laughs> Yes. Oh, so yeah, I, I don't know. Did, is there people out there that you're kind of proud that you, you have uh, work, they're walking around with your work on them? No. <laughs> when I, I had to do the TV show that one time and they got us B-list celebrities to tattoo as like our final challenge on the show. And um, my B-list celebrity was AJ from the Backstreet Boys. And I was just like, this dude sucks at getting tattooed. <laughs> how how did you like how was that experience did you like that uh i didn't hate it i honestly i think maybe because the show i was on wasn't uh they didn't like super haze us into being dramatic like i think some shows like really build this environment to make it as hard to live in as possible and then you you know you eventually just get so pissed off that you explode and look crazy on tv and i don't think that the the show that i was on didn't really do that like they didn't really try that hard. for that extra drama yeah they they i mean they they wanted it they wanted us to be dramatic but uh they didn't like push it they didn't like continuously like wake us up at like four in the morning or something or you know like ink master i think everybody has to sleep in dorms together and i'm like i don't know i don't know if i can do that yeah <laughs> You get that one person that snores and you're just like, oh my God. <laughs> what, what, what was, what's one of your longest, you know, I hate just, just generic questions, but really I, I you know I'm tattooed and I, and uh, I did tattoos and stuff. It's not, wasn't for me. I, I know that it's a, you know, it's definitely a certain kind of person, um, but I still love the, the trade and everything. So I'm wondering what was your longest session that you've done? uh probably like 20 hours Ooh. yeah yeah we we did um collaborative tattoos down in florida at a friend shop and that um it was like it was like it almost became a contest where everybody was like let's see how long we can tattoo <laughs> i felt so bad for the clients because we're just like it's only like five more hours <laughs> i know you've already been here for five hours but it's fine it's fine when I, I don't think I would do that again, just simply because I can't imagine that the healing on that was very easy. Sure. Like that much trauma to your body is probably not a good idea. <laughs> what is your preferred amount of time? Like, do you, like if you're booking somebody to do what, like how long do you usually prefer to go? I like to tattoo for about six hours. Yeah. Well, that's a good amount of time. Do you, yeah. do you, do you have um, any, have you noticed, I mean, you're still way young. So but I'm wondering if you're having any uh, back issues. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, <it's gnarly. laughs> uh, yeah. Like uh, this is an artist thing, you know, like we always, we never, we never think about the ways that we're sitting and doing stuff when we're like 
beginning as an artist like when you're in your 20s and you're like shrimped over just like you know with no light and nothing and <laughs> 10 years later you're like I don't know why my back hurts so much <laughs> Idiot. You after like at, at a six hour does it does it ever happen to you a lot or do you just after a while start feeling like oh man this is I'm a little tense in the back or do you start feeling it at six hours? I it for me it's more of a what have I done with my week you know like I think mm-hmm. I'm at a point in my life where like I have to do enough other active things to counteract the activity of tattooing so I have to be doing some kind of physical activity that isn't tattooing to strengthen my core because it is it's all core like that's where all the problems come from for like most people in their lives at any point in time like whether you work at a desk all day doing computer stuff or you tattoo all day sitting down like if you are if you live a sedentary lifestyle you never get up and exercise or stretch like you everything just starts to curl in on itself and, yeah. and like mummify and so like you have to break out of that at some point if you ever want to um you know not feel like shit for the rest of your life are you doing any yoga <laughs> yeah i do yoga sometimes um i my biggest thing in the last few years has been that i ride a horse that's been my like one thing that always gets me out of the house and like i'm always willing to do it even in the winter which i hate the cold so did you have horses growing up or was that that was a total like hey i I i'm in my 30s i want to learn how to ride a horse (laughs) so so do you just go to like a local place that has horses right um i just found a barn that was like 25 minutes from my house and they like offered lessons and so I started taking lessons and then like you realize once you start taking lessons that if you actually want to be good at it you, you need to have like a horse so you can ride when you're not in a lesson like you have to be able to practice um so there's like options if you if you don't want to buy a horse which is a commitment like financially and you know time wise then they'll like a lot of barns will like lease you one like oh, you can wow. lease a horse I didn't know that until I started doing this. I was like, oh, you can like, like a car, you can lease it. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> so is that something you can just, you like, so when you go over to the stable, you just pull him out. I mean, he's your rental. You just grab yeah. him. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Like I don't have to feed him. I don't have to clean up after him. I can just like show up and get him out and hang out with him and then go ride and then come back and clean him up. You know? And so like, uh, I did, I did buy a horse though. Cause I was like, I'm one of those people that's like all in. Like when I decided to do something, I'm like, I'm doing it, I'm all in. <laughs> so I was like three months into riding and I was like, I want to buy a horse. <laughs> and I went and got a, a mare thoroughbred off track race horse uh, who was like six years old and it was a terrible idea um, because she didn't know what the fuck she was doing and I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And then they put us together and they were like, this should probably be fine. (laughs) And I mean, as far as like expense goes for a horse, she wasn't that expensive because she had no experience. So like the more safe and experienced a horse is, usually the more expensive they are. And I did not know that. (laughs) So our expenses mostly like feeding and stable and I mean, keep. Yeah. So like, like I bought a horse and then I boarded her at the barn that I was lessening with. So like, I just paid them like a monthly fee and they covered like all of her feed and like turnout. And then I, I still had to buy her like all of her things, like her little like blankets for the winter and a saddle and bridle and like all the extra shit you have to get to ride them. Um, do you have a cool custom uh, saddle though? I, yeah, I do actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my favorite thing is my custom half traps though. Those things are tight. Like <laughs> they have little crow skulls on them and it's all leather. Oh my God. It's so cool. So where will you ride? Is there a trail or something or do you just ride in the. Uh, so we have like, an. Uh, so I, I ride at a different barn now and they're so cool. I, I owned two horses. I ended up selling them because the, the one I couldn't ride very well. And I actually broke both my elbows riding her. That was a bad time. Uh, and then the second one, he was cool, but like, he kind of had a limit to what he could do. So I ended up selling him to a friend of mine. And then I now lease this little pony. (laughs) 
he's fucking awesome. His name's Franklin. Um, but yeah, I, I go out to this barn and I, I still take lessons because I'm still learning. And uh, it's kind of like a lifelong thing. Like you're just learning always. <laughs> so I still take lessons and then I'll go ride them. And she has she has trails like you can go out and ride around in the woods and stuff. And she's got a field. You can go ride around in this giant field. Uh, but I mostly do a lot of riding in the arena because it's more controlled in there. Like if he gets scared, like we're not going anywhere because yeah. horses will just randomly be like, ah, and then like take off running because they heard something in the woods or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I love hearing people on horse. I, I've been terrified of horses my whole life. Every horse I've ever been on has bucked me off except for the one. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, that's awesome to hear. What, you you were you mentioned college. You're a, you're a Hoosier, right? Yeah. Holiday World or Fort Wayne Children's Zoo? <laughs> Neither. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, if I had to choose, I'd probably choose the zoo. Theme parks are. I I don't do roller coasters. Uh, I'm not a thrill seeker, despite the fact that I ride a fucking horse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is one thing I'll do, but like a roller coaster, I'm like, no, that's not safe. <laughs> like, <laughs> Especially these days, a corn maze or a game of cornhole? <laughs> uh, cornhole. Way, way less uh, bugs. <laughs> where, where did you grow up at? I grew up in Warsaw, Indiana. Oh, okay. So I, I wasn't too far from Fort Wayne or the Fort Wayne Children's Zoo. Yeah. Uh, I definitely have been there. I've been to Holiday World. It's weird. I don't like it. We have a whole amusement park that's about the holidays of the United States. Like, who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> who loves Thanksgiving that much that they want to ride a ride that's themed after Thanksgiving? Like, come on. Well, what about um, fried Snickers or fried Twinkies? Mm, fried Snickers, for sure. Oh, man. Yeah, that's some heart attack. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we don't live long in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> people that book you now, I mean, you, you're able to kind of, I don't know if curate's the right word, but you're able to pick out, you know, which clients you work. So I don't even know if this question would pertain to you, but how do you handle unruly uh, clients? Do you ever deal with that? Is that ever an issue for you? No, I mean, I, I deal with it for the other girls at the shop now, not so much for myself. I don't have a lot of unruly clients, but generally it's like, you know, we're, a private establishment like this isn't a walmart dude like we don't have to fucking serve you so if you're not gonna adhere to the rules of the shop or be nice to the people that work here you can get the fuck out yeah. <laughs> i remember just like this you know again this is 20 years ago but tattoo shops were always where people thought like oh yeah let's just go hang out and be a dirtbag over the tattoo shop i don't know <laughs> if that's still the case anymore like i don't think that happens as much now yeah. um i do i do remember times like in earlier in my career where people would just come to hang out at the shop. Like they just wanted to stop in and say hi. And like, I tattooed like most of those dudes, like, cause they would just be hanging around and I was an apprentice and I needed to do tattoos and they'd be like, Oh, you want to, she can just tattoo you. And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, like just wanted to hang out in the tattoo shop. You guys allow the, uh, the hang, just hang around at your shop. Uh, if we're friends, if I knew you, yeah, like you can come and chill. Uh, how do you feel about people showing up with like, you know, entourages? I don't even know if they, people do that anymore, but I, know. I, I hate it. People still try to do it. Like they still, we get emails from people that were like, oh, can I bring my husband or can I bring my friend or can I, can me and my friend and their friend come and we all get tattoos. And like, there's people that still want to travel in packs into the tattoo shop. And I always... Uh, discourage that quite a bit because it's just it, it usually ends up not being about the tattoo and it's about what your friends think so oh great yeah the whole um trying to get their friend to come and see how it's looking <laughs> yeah yeah well the timer's got about five more minutes on i'm gonna throw in some highlights on here um ali mcbill or king of the hill oh king of the hill ali McBill kind of annoyed me she's she had a, a weird voice yeah, I don't know what bugged me about her, but she really bothered me. I could not understand why that show was so huge. Yeah, I think it was because it was the first, they had the dancing baby and everybody thought that was crazy. <laughs> crazy CGI technology that we didn't have. 
<laughs> right, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't you watch that show, Adrian? I don't even remember. I'm trying to picture who Allie McAbeal is. She had blonde hair and she was uh, really, really skinny. Yeah. I really, everybody made fun of her for how skinny she was. Yeah. She took a lot of shit for that, which is kind of dumb. Was Sigourney Weaver in Ghostbusters or Sigourney Weaver in Alien? Alien all the way. Oh, my God. What, what piece of yours, um, do you have a piece out there that you're still amazed you were able to pull off? Yeah. Um, I think the mermaid torso one will forever be the one that I was like surprised I found somebody to get it and that like it all worked out. <laughs> At this stage in your career, do you still have those moments where you're about to do a tattoo and you're like, fuck, I don't know. This is like, this one's, I don't know about this. And then it works out and you're like, yep, that was badass. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I think every tattoo I do about halfway through, I'm like, fuck this up. <laughs> And then when you're that far, you just got to, you just keep going. Yeah. You just got to believe you're like, I thought I've been doing this long enough. I'm sure it won't be that bad when it's done. Is that the difference between someone who's been tattooing for a long time and a new one is you just have that confidence during it. You're like, this looks like shit, but you know, I've done enough of these that it works out. I think so. I think so. I think that's the only difference is like, like you, you can still get nervous 10 years in about like your line work and, um, whether or not the design's good and stuff like that. But I think you you just trust yourself a little bit more to get through it. You're like, no, it's going to be fine. Like, I've got a whole portfolio of these. It's going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> when you're after you, you took, you won the show, right? The season, the second <laughs> Yeah, season. I did, yeah. Were you already um, busy? Like, did you already have a huge clientele or did that just like skyrocket you to where you couldn't even, you know, keep the books open ever? had quite a bit of people yeah. trying to get tattooed um i think the difference was it allowed me to travel internationally a little more especially once the show hit overseas and stuff then it was like a lot of invitations to come and do conventions and people like throwing you a free booth they're like yeah you can have it for free if you just want to come and you like the conventions i do i love it i love traveling i like the is there, there's just something exciting about doing conventions. It's like being around a bunch of other artists that are all want to do the same thing. And like, I always feel so inspired when I come back from them because there's always a million artists that are fucking killing it. And I was like, didn't even know about them. And then I see their shit. I'm like, how the fuck have I never heard of this person? Like, they're so good. And come home and I'm just like, man, I really need to work harder. Right. <laughs> Is there growth? Like, is there still, are there still things undiscovered in the tattoo world? Do you think like styles that haven't been done yet? Or, or do you think um, now it, w there's a point where it's now we're just uh, perfecting those styles or do you think there's still possibility for uh, new things to happen in the tattoo industry? I think there's still possibility. I think that there's plenty of art styles out there and new ones being made all the time that may or may not translate into tattooing well. I think we've seen a lot of stuff that people tried that they were like, this is going to be great. And then we were like, oh, that didn't last very long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I feel like some of those things will either get revisited or we'll see new new things happening or just with like, I, I look forward to progression of the tools. That's kind of always my uh, main thing because, you know, when I started out, like coil machines were the, the thing. No one, I mean, you know, you're no coil at all, right? No, not anymore. No, I just have, I have the pen from Cheyenne. I fucking love, it's wireless. Like who would have even thought that we would have got to a point where you just had wire. Like I remember them testing that shit out six, seven years ago and it just failing miserably. And then like now they've got it. They figured it out. They're like, do you know what that, what it was? What, what technically what that was? What, what was the issue there? Like, how is that working now? Uh, I think the issue was that people were trying to make coil machines wireless ah. and there's, they don't run on batteries. So to make a coil machine wireless, like you, you, how do you get that connection of electromagnetic like power to that machine? And then when they started making rotaries, like there was a brief period of time where they were doing pneumatic stuff with like air compressors. And I'm like, that was the last one I got a pneumatic. Yeah. And that doesn't really. Hey, I had a question. You um, said that the the show opened up doors for you to travel internationally. Um, do you have a favorite spot that you've gone to so far? Oh my God, yes, I love I love Barcelona. Like Barcelona, Spain is amazing. 
Um, the food there is great. The atmosphere, like we, they usually do a convention there in October called the Barcelona Tattoo Expo. And it is fantastic. Uh, but aside from that, like the city is just amazing. Just, I don't know, like everywhere there's a really super nice and being American and not speaking any other languages, like <laughs> they're, they're very chill about that. Like they, they don't get upset with you. Like I know in France, like people are always like, they're so mean. And I'm like, well, cause you came over there and you learned nothing. And then you're trying to make them understand you by screaming at them. So. It's funny, you know, traveling American, like we just, you know, tend to just like expect people to know what we're. I've definitely tried to learn like important phrases in countries that I visit so that I can at least somewhat communicate if they've got no English behind them. But it is nice that like, uh, there are a lot of countries where it's, they do speak English. Like even if it's not their first language, like they put an effort into learning it. <laughs> yeah. I think they, pre I think anyone appreciates that you even tried. <clears throat> um, this, my timer went off, uh, I, I, I'm still got a lot more I'm going to do on this. Um, I'm super appreciative that you, um, were willing to join us on the show before I let you go. I know you're all, you're booked, right? You're, I mean, you're pretty much always booked. Yeah. Right now. I don't know when I'll be able to take on any new, uh, tattoo appointments just because I uh, took on so many during COVID to try and offset the people that couldn't make it out to me. So I thought I was going to open my books and, the fall and now i'm like well, that's probably not gonna happen so. <laughs> is there anything though else oh yeah because you have a don't you have you did like um you have a book out though right like a yeah i just released uh my first ever book and it's like a collection of the drawings i did during covid so it's got all 53 drawings that i did um and then I made some of them into prints. I made some of them into stickers. Uh, and it, so like you can either get like the set or you can just get the book, uh, but they're available through my website, uh, unkindnessart.com. And those uh, are still available. I mean, that's, that's a new thing. Yeah, that just came out uh, this year. Um, it took me quite a while to put it together because I had never <laughs> made a book before. And I was like, oh my God, I have to download programs to do this. Ah! <laughs> Are you a perfectionist? Do you, do you find? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you gotta be right. Yeah. And I like, I put a lot of time into like packaging and, um, you know, trying to like make it like a full thing. Like I don't, I don't ever just like throw anything out uh, that's like not fully finished. Well, that so. goes a long way though. Like having, having quality control on your, on what you provide, like that goes a long way. That'll just keep people always wanting to get from you. I, I applaud that big time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, uh, putting the, put the time and the energy and the effort into making sure that it's exactly what I want. So like the boxes that they come in, I, I had made for it specifically. And then the book itself, like I sourced a few different companies to try and find the one that would give me a paper that felt closer to the paper that it was actually drawn on as opposed to just like a gloss, uh, thin print. Like I don't like, uh, texture is like a big thing to me when I like buy stuff from other artists, if they have like uh, a nice like stock paper that they use to print on, like that's yeah. so much more exciting for me than when it's just like something that feels like came from a FedEx, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i get really into that stuff <laughs> i have friends that do that still they just go up to fucking kinkos and like make prints and then these days though that whole xerox print might be kind of like a cool throwback sort of thing you know like, <laughs> oh, yeah, this is old school we do these uh xerox printing <laughs> yeah um i admire your work ethic i i, I admire your work 100 percent. it's awesome so yeah is there anything else that you would like to uh mention that we can uh, uh the people can support yeah. um, I will be teaching a seminar at the Explorer Tattoo Convention, um, Explorer Tattoo Seminars that's coming up uh, September, I believe, 6th to the 8th. Uh, and that's in Dallas, Texas. So I'll be there uh, teaching uh, my seminar on tattooing. Hopefully this time around, have some actual video footage to show people. Last time I kind of just had to work from photo references and stuff like that, but I'm hoping I have a few small tattoos that I'm going to be doing start to finish prior to that, that I'll be taping and explaining stuff 
in there. So do you like yeah. that teaching aspect? Do you like doing that? I do. I never thought that I would. I never thought that it was something that I would want to do because I, I, you know, like, I think I got asked a lot when I told people when I was a kid that I wanted to be an artist and they're like, Oh, you're going to be an art teacher. And I'm like, yeah. no, I want to be a fucking artist. Like, I want to draw. Like, I don't want to teach other people how to draw. Um, I got so tired of that that I like was like, never, I'll never teach. And then you built that like a thing was built around. Yeah. You yeah. Could. Yeah. It felt like a, like a step backwards. But now, um, having been in this long enough, I, I realized that I, I guess, bring like a unique voice to the uh, industry and to like what I do. And so. Did you I find that you that. learned more actually by teaching? Yes. I think it really makes you look at what you do and why you do it. And you have to answer those questions before you can go tell people yeah. how to do it. So understanding why I'm making decisions and where I could improve happens when you have to like critically think about what you're doing. So yeah. it's interesting. I like it. Well, um, I want to thank you uh, again so much for joining us on the show. It was awesome. It was really nice chatting with you. I like to get the perspective. So Yeah, you as well. Thanks so much for having me. It was super fun. And uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. This is great. Well, awesome. Same to you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Teresa, thank you again for joining me on DOD 45. It was an honor to have you on the show, and I look forward to seeing what amazing pieces you come up with in the days ahead. While I know it is nearly impossible to get a booking with you, I hope one day I will have the chance to get a whole back piece done by you in the future. I'd like to work that out somehow. Head over to unkindnessart.com to check out Teresa's merch and for her upcoming schedule and seminar information or follow her Instagram to see what beautiful pieces she's working on. If you'd like to find out more about me and my art, head over to artbytai.com. That's art by T-A-I. And if you happen to be on a Twitter scroll, check out my Twitter at art by Ty. But be sure not to hit the follow button. That would be absurd, truly absurd. <laughs> As always, you can find all the links in the notes below. That's it for now. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll see you around next time. Cheers. The thoughts in my head take place in my bed, and I don't have to lie. Thanks for watching this episode of DOD 45. I hope that you enjoyed yourself. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. I don't want you to ever miss an episode. Also stick around my YouTube page for a bit. There's a whole array of videos to enjoy, including time-lapse videos, drawing tutorials, and live streams. It's like an amusement park. Now click that subscribe button and go watch another episode of DOD 45. Cheers.